What's up, everybody? Okay, so a little live Q&A. One of my favorite things to do. I was a little sick this weekend. Had to go get a little COVID test, but all's good. Back at it, grinding away. Yeah, listen, if you're just joining, let me know where you're from. I want to know where you're from. I'm over here in North Jersey, just hustling away. I'm in my office right now. Um, just got done having some phone calls, some meetings with the team, just growing the business, you know? So the way this is going to work is the way it always works. Just shoot your questions in the comments and I'll answer them. Whatever it is, I'm happy to help. I love spending my nights with you. No, it was not the Rona. It was definitely not the Rona. Uh, Southern California in the house. We got New Hampshire. Let's see if we can get all over the world. We got the UK. Okay, who else is from other countries? We got Toronto. All right, Georgia, the state or the country. San Diego, North Jersey. Okay, Hawaii, Illinois, LA. Damn, we're all over the place today. New York, England, Omaha, Nebraska. <laughs> all right, let's get to it then. I'm ready to. I'm ready to provide some value. Looks like we just got our first question. Is retail arbitrage a good way to start? And that is from FU5463. Yeah, I think retail arbitrage is a great way to start. It's A, you don't need a lot of money to do it. So you don't have to invest a lot of funding in order to get started. You can start with 100 bucks and go to your local retail store and just start purchasing inventory, scanning it, making sure it's profitable and start purchasing it. So I think it's a great learning experience for anybody who's just getting started because it will really allow you to learn about all of the different fees and shipping and everything that's included when you're selling on Amazon. You know, it's important to understand the pick and pack fees. It's important to understand the referral fees. It's important to understand how to ship your products to Amazon. So I think retail arbitrage is definitely a great way to get started there. And if anybody doesn't know what retail arbitrage is, retail arbitrage is when you go to retail stores and you purchase products from those stores to then resell for a profit on Amazon. Now there's four different methods of selling online. There's retail arbitrage, online arbitrage is the same thing as retail arbitrage, but instead of purchasing the products from retail stores, you're purchasing them online from other marketplaces and then selling them on Amazon for a profit. And then another type of um, operation of selling on Amazon is called private label. And that's where you're actually manufacturing your own products to sell for a profit on Amazon based on your market research. And we do do some private label over here. We also primarily focus on wholesale, which is the last business model. Wholesale, which essentially is buying brand name products that people know and trust already, and then reselling them on Amazon for a profit. We got Morocco in the house, South Africa. Wow, we're so far we're in three continents. We got Africa, we got Europe, and we got North America. I can't find the right price. The right price for what? When you're when you're looking for products, if you can't find the right price, you got you're gonna have to negotiate some deals. Now, if you're buying from retail stores, and this is why I love wholesale so much, because there's room for negotiation. There's always room for negotiation. You know, if they have it listed at, at ten dollars in their catalog, they probably played eight. So you know, you got two dollars to work with, and I love that two dollar window because I'm I'm trying to get that lowest as possible. So I really love the wholesale business model because it allows you to negotiate based on how much money you're spending, what your relationships with these people are, and all that good stuff. Getting stuck on product selection, regardless of what business model you're doing, whether it's private label, wholesale, retail arbitrage, don't get caught up and take you know two three months to find that first product. Because if you just, let's just say you're you're doing wholesale, right? And you're, you're struggling to find your first product. It takes you three months to buy your first product. In those three months, you could have already bought some products. Yeah, you might have broke even on them, but you can't put a price tag on knowledge. I tell people all this time when they're considering signing up for our mentoring program. Like you can't put a price tag on the knowledge that we provide to you. You can't put a price tag on the knowledge that you'll gain for purchasing some products and listing them on Amazon. You just can't put a price tag on that because the information you're going to get from doing that is going to revolutionize the way your business operates and grows into the future. It's going to be a straight game changer. So I always encourage people the best way to get started really doing anything is just to get started. Just start selling some shit. 
You know, don't get caught up in the analysis paralysis stage, which I see people do all the time. They want to watch a million YouTube videos and, and purchase 15 courses and, and, and be members of every Facebook group and, and follow everybody on Instagram, but they, dev, they never actually took action. So it's the action takers who are going to succeed. So I encourage all of you to take action. We got another Morocco in the house. Are the two people in Morocco here? Are you guys hanging out right now or girls? Same thing. Can't find this the right product to sell. Don't get caught up in the uh, paralysis of analyzation. Costco or Sam's? Costco. Costco, definitely. Brazil. All right, we got South Africa here. Now we're just missing, we're missing Asia. I think that's it. Oh, and Australia and Antarctica. If we get someone, listen, if we get someone from Antarctica in here, I'm going to give some shit away because that would just be wild. Is hiring a virtual assistant a good idea? I get this question all the time. Yes, hiring a virtual assistant is a good idea if you know how to do it yourself. If you know how to do whatever you're going to source out to a virtual assistant, if you know how to do that, then absolutely hire a virtual assistant. But if you don't know how to do that yet, if you're still learning it yourself, then you should become a master of it before you go giving it to somebody else. Because there's so much to learn and know about outsourcing tasks. And if you don't know, you just don't know. Right? That sounds super basic, but it's facts. If you don't know, you don't know. So how are you supposed to know if your virtual assistant's even doing the job correctly if you've never done correctly the job that you're giving him to do? Right. So there's like a disconnect here. I think everybody instantly thinks Amazon passive income, passive income, virtual assistant, virtual assistant. But you got to stay on top of your game and make sure that the, the tasks that you're delegating to these VAs, that they're doing them correctly or you're just pouring money into someone who's just researching, researching, doing product research, whatever, optimizing your listings, whatever it is. And they might not be doing it properly. Now, obviously, there's certain things that I'm not a professional in, and I'm sure a lot of you aren't professionals in, um, like copywriting, right? I'm not a copywriter, so I, but I understand how copywriting works. I know what a good copywritten email or a good copywritten advertisement looks like because I read them all the time. So my knowledge of copywriting, it's not professional, but it's not no vice either. You know, I'm right in the middle. So when I bring on a virtual assistant to do copywriting for me, I'm able to analyze their work and be like, listen, this is good ad copy. This is trash ad copy and sort through the two. So I suggest before you hire a virtual assistant, become a master of that crap. Um, Braxton just said, what if a supplier says 10 to 15 K a week orders are required do you think they are just saying that to scare new businesses away? Um, so I say yes, no problem. I say yes, no problem. That's what they want to hear. And that would be my goal too. And that should be your goal as a business owner is of course you want to do ten to fifteen thousand dollars a week. Of course. That's anybody's goal. You know, maybe you could do twenty five thousand dollars bi weekly and get close to that. Maybe you could do, you know, thirty thousand dollars a month. But to open that account and really get the momentum going, you want to make sure that you're obviously placing purchase orders, but you also don't want to overextend yourself. So now if a company said, you listen, you have to purchase $200,000 a month to open the account and you have $2,000 in your account. Now that's obviously, it's just not going to work because you're going to waste their time. They're going to waste their time and it's just not going to build the relationship that you are trying to harvest and build. But if you can get close to that, then absolutely just agree to it. Say, sure, no problem. Fluff up that first order a little bit. If, it, if, it's, if you're confident purchasing $10,000 worth of inventory, but there's another 2,000 that you're like kind of on the edge with, they're maybe missing your margins by a couple points, just put them on the, put them on the order. It's gonna help you grow that relationship. I hope that answered your question, Braxton. All right, we got Joe who said, what are some activities that you outsource to VAs? Data, data sorting. Um, so one of the activities we specifically outsource to VAs is sorting all the data that we have. So when we get invoices um, from some of our distributors, they work in an average pricing metric, right? So it's not first in, first out. So let's say we place the order on a Tuesday and we'll just say, for example, I'm trying to find a product. Let's say I'm buying this stapler, right? I'm buying this stapler. It's $4, right? But because they don't work in first and first out, if they get a hundred more of these staplers in their warehouse at 390, 
they're going to average that price out. So what we use those VAs for is to analyze those price changing in invoices and update them in our system so we can properly track profits. Also, something else that you could be use a VA for is finding the companies that you want to reach out to. Have a VA, you know, s scroll through Google and find some brands or companies or distributors that you want to reach out to. And then you should really be doing the legwork and you should be the one reaching out to them because the VA doesn't understand the business like you understand the business. So in order to make sure you're securing that account, you definitely want to be on the phone. All right, we got a question here from Fleming Mark. Do you know when the FBA 200 quantity max limit will come off? Was meant to be just Q4. No, it wasn't really meant to be any time specifically. Um, Amazon did it to eliminate overages within their fulfillment network. So I've personally seen, you know, we ship over 70,000 orders a week to Amazon. So we ship, and those 70,000 orders are probably across 5,000 different SKUs, maybe four to 5,000 different SKUs. So we ship a lot of products. And from my experience, I've seen that they've actually lifted those limits or increased those limits for a lot of products. So there is light at the end of the tunnel, my friends. There definitely is light at the end of the tunnel. So how do you register barcodes? So you don't essentially register barcodes you purchase barcodes from gs1.org. Um, that is the authorized distributor of barcodes across the world. Um, you could, a lot of people, they'll tell you to use Speedy Barcodes or any of these other third-party barcode sites. I highly recommend purchasing your barcodes from GS1. How long to hear back about the course? Just signed up yesterday. So you will get, first of all, we're going to review your application. My team and I, we sit down and look at every candidate um, because it is not just an open for everyone course. We want to make sure that you're willing to take action. You have the financial investment to commit to it. Um, and also that you're willing to put in the work to succeed um, because we don't just want to sell courses to sell courses. We want to sell courses to help people grow businesses. So we vet each member before they join. Um, so we'll take a look at your application and if everything makes sense and me and my team agree on your qualifications, then we'll send you a follow-up email to book a call with us. Afghanistan, West Africa, London, London, Wow, I'm probably way up on these comments. Uh, Nicole Montoya said, just two days on the course and I'm already loving it. Oh boy, why didn't I join before? 2020 or 2021, let's grow, fantastic. Nicole, honestly, I, I love to hear that. But when, when people tell me that, I'm not surprised. You know, we put our blood, sweat, and tears in this in this training course that we offer. It's literally, you know, a year and a half of filming content to create it and over 15 years of e-commerce experience. So if I was to get a message that said something different, that would surprise me. But to hear that you love it makes me super happy. And I'm super grateful that you're really enjoying the content. That's the name of the game here. We want to help you grow. Your success is, is our success. Shoppable uh videos the future yeah i definitely think that's a uh, great little point you you put up here on clubhouse i've been talking about this and there's been groups talking about it for the past couple of days but like the future of amazon that's kind of what the the lingering question is here like what is the future of amazon and i really think it's going to go to video heavy i'm talking you know every listing if you don't have a video on your listing with enhanced brand content then people aren't going to buy your stuff there's going to be more video reviews and they're really gonna be pumping out video because on Amazon, when you're purchasing a product, you can't touch it, you can't feel it, you can't smell it. You're just buying it based on the description and the images. You know, and a, and a picture's worth of, I say a million dollars, not a thousand words, because a good picture can really sell something, but imagine what a great video can do. It can really change the game up. All right, Eric Barraza said, tips from moving from RA to wholesale. I've been doing five figures a month for the past three months. First of all, that's huge, man. That's 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 definitely an accomplishment, you know, to be doing five figures a month for the past three months, just going to stores and buying retail arbitrage. So congratulations on that. I'm excited for your success and the future of your company. Um, so my honest opinion would be, your best bet would be to join eSellers RI. What you could start doing is 
you could start making the transition, right? So for us, it took almost two years to make that transition. We were heavy on retail arbitrage doing, you know, five or six million dollars a year going to the big clubs, you know, buying everything they had and reselling it on Amazon for a profit. But in order to make that transition, we had to slowly integrate wholesale into our business model. So the first three months, we were probably a 10% retail arbit or 10% wholesale business, 90% retail arbitrage. And then by month six, we were probably 20, 80. And then by month nine, we were 70, 30. So it was like, it, it took time. But really what you want to do is start building relationships with distributors and wholesalers, start growing those relationships and start purchasing products so you can get a feel for wholesale. But don't stop doing RA yet, because if RA is generating the income and it's bringing in the money, then keep doing RA. But your goal would be to step back from doing RA because RA is super, super time consuming. You're spending so much time doing retail arbitrage, driving from store to store and sending this person there. And you're getting, you know, two of this and five of this and 10 of this. Like literally, we have products. We just sent out a shipment today. It was the whole shipment was two SKUs and those SKUs, they sell 150 units a day, you know, and, and literally it took me 30 minutes to put together the order. I paid my driver to go pick it up, took him an hour to go get it. And then it took my team downstairs, you know, six hours to process it. And we just sent 13,000 units into Amazon. And this literally happened today. So like the wholesale business model is scalable, my friends. That's not to knock retail arbitrage. I'm not knocking online arbitrage. I'm not knocking private label. I've, I've done them all and I still do wholesale and private label. But retail arbitrage has limitations. So don't limit yourself. Um, your store name. This is another great question. Eric Barraza, hit me with those questions. Um, your store name does not matter, uh, but it should be broad, roomy, and all-inclusive. And what I mean by that is, let's just say you start selling sports products, right? You start selling baseball gloves and soccer cleats and, and uh, you know, knee pads. And, like, that's where you start, right? So you're like, oh, you're, you're getting all inventive. And you're like, I'm going to name my store like the sports guy or the sports girl or best sports deals. And then like three months later, you end up selling a lot of health and beauty products and grocery products. And it's like, will people really be comfortable buying, you know, their lipstick from the sports guy or buying their Cheerios or their Quaker Oats from the sports guy? Probably not. So I would encourage you when you're picking your store name to go roomy and all inclusive. So something like, you know, best deals or, you know, top number one distributor. I'm just spitballing things here. Don't pick any of those, but think it out. It should take you 20 minutes. You can even use, there's websites that will generate names for you. You could type in, you know, e-commerce and distributor and wholesaler, and it'll literally spit out 50 different possibilities. And then I would suggest looking on USPTO.gov to make sure that, the trademark for that isn't taken. And also I would check on either Google domains or GoDaddy and make sure you could purchase the domain for that as well. So it's much more than just a store name. You want to make sure you can own the brand, right? Because our company over here, like Amazon Lit is a brand. People invest in the brand. People, when they buy products from us on Amazon, they invest in our, our service and they know we're trustworthy. So you want to make sure that you're building a brand. So that means registering your brand and also trademarking your name and also owning the domains to your brand. Empire Distribution, no questions here. Just a shout out to you. Always teaching and sharing so much value. Appreciate you, my friend. Hey, I had a question. If we don't have buy box, how much harder is it to sell the product? I said most of the sales come from the buy box. Me personally, I'm not a buy box shopper. When I do my shopping, I'm a deal shopper. So I'm not, maybe it's just because I sell on Amazon for a living, but I'm checking out that back page. I'm looking at the other sellers and I'm, I'm the guy who buys stuff from people not in the buy box because I'm looking at seller reviews. I'm looking at customer feedback. I'm looking at all that other good stuff. Um, and if it's a prime offer, if it's a prime offer and it's a dollar more, but the seller has, you know, 50,000 more reviews, then most likely I'm, 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 I'm trusting his product just a little more, her product just a little more. Um, so 
It is harder to sell, definitely without a doubt. It's harder to sell when you're not in the buy box. The name of the game when selling on Amazon is win the buy box. You want your buy box percentage to be healthy and you want to have as many products in the buy box on any given day as humanly possible. That's the name of the game. Those are the days you're going to really see massive sales. So the name of the game is how to win the buy box. But if you're not in the buy box, it doesn't mean you won't sell products. You just won't sell as much products. What is a simple way to prioritize business finances? Um, so I would definitely integrate with something like Avalara is good. Um, it's like a financial tracking software. Um, and integrate something, you know, that can track your expenses, track your cost of goods, track your labor, track your rent, track all that. You definitely want to handle your business expenses. And don't forget here, everybody, I'm going to uh, let me share this with everyone right now, because I want you to be in the mindset of a business owner. You think someone who opens up a deli or or let's just say let's go even bigger than that. Let's go corporations. Let's go franchises. Right. We'll go franchises. Let's say McDonald's, for example. Right. Do you think someone goes to purchase a McDonald's in whatever town they want to purchase it in and is planning on running that McDonald's and they don't have some understanding of the business side of things. They have to have an understanding of the business side of things. They need to understand what their average uh, sale is, you know, how much sales they're generating in a week, how many sales they're generating in a month, what their best seller is so, so they can keep those in stock. What is their gross profit for the month? How much revenue are they bringing in? What are their net profits? How much are they spending in in labor costs you know what are the costs for all the utilities that they're using they need to understand these things because they are business owners i see resellers do this all the time not saying any of you are doing it but i'm just saying i see it they do this all the time where they start selling on poshmark or ebay or mercari or amazon or walmart or whatever fill in the blank marketplace but yet they have no idea that they're not treating it like a business. You have to treat it like a business. That's what you're doing. That's where growth is going to happen. So if you are selling on an e-commerce marketplace, start analyzing your numbers, my friends. Start digging into your profits. Start digging into your margins. Start digging into your expenses. And I guarantee you, you will see your business grow. What does your daily schedule look like? Typical week for me, you know, I'm up 7 a.m., 7.15, prayer meditation, shower, out the door, on my way to work, either bump some Hot 97 or I listen to a podcast or a book that I've downloaded on Audible that talks about some sort of growth mindset and mentality. Then I get into the office. First thing I do is check all my emails. I got about four different email accounts I check. Um, they're also on my phone, connected to my phone, but I'm checking all those emails. Takes maybe a half hour to an hour, depending on how many emails I've gotten and how important those emails are and how readily they needed to be responded to. Then I'm diving into our repricer, spending, you know, two to three hours in our repricer, making sure that there's no outliers, nothing that we sold, you know, 600 of yesterday because there was a pricing error and we're selling it for $10 cheaper than it should be. Um, nothing that we haven't sold in three or four weeks because we're just priced too high or we're not buy box competitive. So I spend a few hours doing that. And then usually around noon, I go downstairs, walk around for about an hour, kind of just check out the operations downstairs, see what the stations are doing. And I kind of just observe, right? It looks like I'm not doing anything from like an outsider's perspective, but I'm just observing because I'm looking for ways to tweak our production processes to generate more revenue for our business. So I'm just kind of walking around, you know, hey ladies, how's the day going? Just kind of picking up random products, making sure they're packaging them properly, making sure the pallets are palletized and organized, just kind of, or and, and overseeing the process to look for potential changes to streamline those efficiencies which in turn will generate more profits on the back end. Um, and then by then it's probably two o'clock. I'm back upstairs, usually working on either a purchase order or I'm back in our repricer. Um, and then, you know, I, I have a lot of meetings with, uh, lately it's been filled with, with meetings with potential clients to work with. And, and usually, you know, I'm here at 8.30ish, 8, 8.30 and I'm gone at, maybe 8.39 most days. 
And then, you know, two or three days a week, I like to go to the gym. I'm going to go to the gym after, actually after this. I actually have a call. I have a meeting in 15 minutes, so I'm going to wrap this up soon. But I have a meeting, and then I'm going to slide to the gym. And then I go home and just wind down a little, talk to my girl, and just chill out. I am lost finding a product to sell. Please give me advice. Yeah, I touched on this before. Just do your research. And if you're doing private label, that's why you're lost. Because you're you're probably, this is my guess, probably never sold anything on Amazon. And correct me if I'm wrong. We probably never sold anything on Amazon. You're trying to create a private label product. So you're trying to understand all this new terminology and all these fees and all these shipping and all these different structures that you just don't understand and you can't grasp because you've never done it before. So you're trying to create a private label product with zero experience and you're stuck and you've hit a roadblock. I can promise you that's where you're at right now because you haven't taken the time to just start selling some shit. I encourage everybody, if you're going to do private label, you should first do retail arbitrage for three to six months because it's going to teach you so much about the industry and it's going to provide you such a large insight on what needs to be done. It's going to allow you to create a much better private label product in three to six months. And I guarantee you that Um, best way to approach a manufacturer or distributor for more units without getting blocked as a reseller. You're already looking at it wrong, Tuck. If you have to limit the amount of inventory you're purchasing from a distributor to hide that the fact that you sell on Amazon, you are not in the process of building a lifelong relationship. You are in the process of a get rich quick scheme, which will allow you to produce revenue and make profits for the next two to three months until that manufacturer, distributor, or brand does not sell to you anymore, right? But I always encourage everybody who I talk to or train or teach or is in my mentoring and consulting course, like I tell them like, do not lie to these distributors. Yeah, you you might be able to make 10,000 bucks in the next three months, but I rather make 10,000 bucks for the next three months for the next five years every three months because now you're talking 40,000 a year times the next five years. Now you're talking $200,000, almost a quarter million bucks from this one distributor because you were honest with them. So I I would not encourage um, the lying to your distributor to tell them that you have five brick and mortar stores to get more units to resell on Amazon because they're going to figure that shit out, man. It's the supply chain, supply and demand. Listen, until Amazon came around, let me just paint a little picture here for y'all. Until Amazon came around, there was no distributor selling 6,000 units to one store, right? There's no mom and pop store in the middle of Connecticut selling 6,000 units every three weeks. Like, like stores just don't do those type of numbers. Amazon does those type of numbers. Now, maybe if it was a Walmart or like a Target or one of those big box stores, then absolutely 6,000 units is a drop in the bucket. But if you say you, you operate a small operation in New Hampshire or like Illinois or Texas, wherever you're located, like stores like that are in place in 6,000 unit POs. So it's an instant red flag. Kairov said... You guys see high FBA fees on some products on small and light products. What's the highest FBA fees reimbursement did you get? Um, So we've gotten reimbursements for the difference between what we should have paid and what was actually paid. Um, And there's great softwares that help you do this. Um, Veriship is one. If you want, send me a text or DM after this call, which I'm going to wrap out up in about uh, 10 minutes here, send me a DM and I'll send you over a, di- um, a discounted link to set up with Veriship. It's completely free, but the discount is in the amount of money you get back, right? So you save percentage points on the amount of money they find from reimbursements. Um, and we do not, we no longer sell small and light. We stopped selling uh, small and light because they dropped the maximum price requirement to $7 from $15. All right, I'm gonna powerhouse through some of these last questions here because I got a meeting in 10 minutes. Courses fire people worth 10 times what they charge. Alan, man, appreciate you, my friend. And this is, so this is this is the mentality here, right? Because there's other, listen, there's other wholesale courses. There's other courses on the market and they're less expensive. And this is what happens. I see it all the time and it's almost, it's almost funny to at this point, but it's sad 
sad at the same time. It's like it makes me laugh because it's like another one, but it makes me sad because it's like shit, they're out, you know, two grand. But what happens is this is the road most course purchasers travel, right? They purchase a course because it's inexpensive. They purchase the $14.99 or the or the the $19.97, the $2,000 course because they think it's going to give them what they need. They go through it, they're, they learn some things, but they're disappointed. But they purchase that because they were scared to invest the extra thousand, two thousand bucks in the only course they would ever need. I see it happen all the time. Most of the people who join our course are people who've joined other courses and were super disappointed with the information that was provided. So now instead of just being three or five thousand dollars invested into training in a course, they're ten or fifteen because they purchased three other courses that didn't deliver the solution that they were looking for. How complicated would it be to import to Amazon? Amazon, let's say products from Brazil, um, let's say chips. They have a barcode, meet um, USDA standards, everything is Gucci. Would Amazon give me a hard time? No. No, absolutely not. As long as you have all those approvals and all the information is filled out and it's an approved food product in the United States, then absolutely it wouldn't be an issue. You just have to get it to an Amazon Fulfillment Center. I would encourage you first to create the listing and make sure you're not running into ro any roadblocks when creating that listing. With trade shows canceled, where do you source? Um, so trade shows are in-person canceled, but they're still hosting them virtually. If you go to websites like asdonline.com or Expo West, or Expo East, those are some great references. Um, you can actually still see the vendors that would be attending those trade shows. It's just not in person. Do you recommend getting a loan to grow your business? Absolutely, I recommend getting a loan to grow your business. If you don't have the capital, then absolutely I recommend getting a loan for your company if you don't have the capital. Um, because it will allow you to grow your capital and grow your sales and grow your business. Um, we, we took an Amazon lending loan probably about a year into our company and it allowed us to go, you know, from two or three million a year to seven or eight million a year because we were able to use that to continue to grow our business and, and really guide our company in the right direction. All right, I'm gonna do two more questions here and then I gotta break out. You sell toys. We have been getting hundreds of policy compliance requests for toys that are for under 12. Loads of sellers. Yes, right now that's a big problem with children's toys. You're getting those CPC um, requirements that need to be met. Um, you could actually go to, don't quote me on this, I think it's cpc.org or cpc.gov. Just type in CPC uh, search on, on Google and there's a website where you can actually search for CPC documentation or CPSC, one of the two. You can actually serve for that documentation. And if if you can't find it on there, then your best bet, the, the wholesaler or distributor is not gonna have access to it. The only person you'll be able to get that from is a manufacturer. And I've tried that in the past with some other certifications that I've needed and, it, and it's nearly impossible to get that information. So make sure you're always creating a test listing to make sure there's no restriction. Also, how do you manage expiry, expiry dates on grocery items? Do you list as a new SKU for the same product every time you get a new batch with different expiry dates? Um, no, so we actually store the dates in a Excel file. It's documented when it's packaged. So if there's any complaints we could reference that. Um, but listen, I have a meeting in three minutes here. So I'm going to break out. I Listen, there's tons of questions I didn't get to, but I'm super grateful for all the ones I did get to. And I'm super grateful for each and every one of you spending this hour with me. I love doing it. I love, you know, helping guide you through this process. I'm here to help you. Um, so with that being said, I'll see you at the next one. I'm doing these every week for 2021. So if you didn't get your question asked, make sure you turn on your notifications so next time I go live, you get notified and you could be at the top of that question asking. And then we'll see you in the next one. Have a beautiful day. Stay lit.